This week, Zane Bond from Keeper Security is with us to discuss securing your secrets. Then, Aaron Keneally from Sentinel One joins us to talk about cyber insurance. Finally, in the enterprise security news, Island raises another $150 million to build a secure web browser less than two months after raising $100 million. Bionic raises $65 million for application intelligence. Israeli startup Hub Security merges with a spec to go public on the NASDAQ at a $1.28 billion valuation. Cybersecurity now has 53 unicorns, but which ones are the most interesting to follow? New data shows VCs pulling back in Series A, B, and C, but is this data any good? Over 90% of orgs had an incident tied to a third party last year, and the SEC might require public companies to report hacks and hand over more details than they currently do. All that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Endpoint security is designed to protect every device in your fleet, wherever it may be. These days, that can be a lot of different places. Find out how HP Wolf Security uses emerging strategies like application isolation, along with a zero-trust approach and framework to give you a powerful, manageable, usable solution to your growing and increasingly spread out security challenges. Learn how HP Wolf Security can make a difference across your endpoints at securityweekly.com forward slash HP Wolf. Attacks can't be prevented, but they can be stopped. Modern cyber attackers have already made it inside your network, but you have the upper hand. Find and eradicate threats with extra hop network detection and response and shut them out before real damage is done. Learn the advanced techniques attackers are using and how extra hop stops them with a live attack simulation. Register at securityweekly.com forward slash extra hop. That's extra H O P. Welcome to enterprise security weekly and happy national cocktail day. This is episode 266, recorded on Thursday, March 24th, 2022. I am your host, Adrian Sanabria, and joining me today is Tyler Shields, who's going to tell us what his favorite cocktail is. That's a good question. My favorite cocktail, I, I uh, it's got to be an old fashioned. I'm a, a straight bourbon or a bourbon on a rock kind of guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll drink that probably three nights a week. But if you really got me into a cocktail, it's probably a old fashioned or potentially a smoked old fashioned. Yeah, same here. Old fashioned Manhattan sidecar. Uh, I, I like some of the classics. Yeah, How about you, you Katie? I'm a cliche. Um, I like either fruity or sweet martinis. Last okay. week, oh, and my dog's drinking just in honor of National Cocktail Day, although she's just drinking water, no worries, no animal abuse here. Last weekend, <laughs> I had a, um, a cinnamon martini, and that was absolutely delicious. They called it a cinnamon toast crunch martini, but it was just cinnamon whiskey, I think. And it was delicious. We should, uh, we should follow this up with the question of what is the most unique or interesting martini you've ever had. Mine is a tiramisu martini. Oh, that could be good. That could definitely yes, be good. It was very good. I also, same night, had a banana bread martini and it was also delicious. I'd never had that before. I, I generally don't go for crazy stuff, but um, I, I have to say one of my favorite um, but it is a variation on the old fashioned. I, I had a mezcal old fashioned that had some oh. other changes to it as well. And it was really, really good. All right. But I, I will add one, one additional cocktail. My favorite cocktail that I always take people to is the Verbena at the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Vegas uh, at the Chandelier Bar on the second floor only. You eat a flower that comes with the drink that is a Szechuan bud that as it numbs your mouth out and as the numbness wears off the flavor profile of the drink changes over time whoa cool. <laughs> that 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 is the most specific recommendation i've heard in a long time <laughs> yeah I will so tell you, second I will floor tell you, only second floor well i think they might have opened it up it used to be only on the second floor and it wasn't on the menu it is now on the menu because so many people asked for it yeah that sounds like an experience 
It is. There's a new tavern near me. It's my new favorite place to go. And they have a peanut butter whiskey iced coffee. And you wouldn't think that would work, but it's really good. And it's not sweet, but it's it's delicious. Oh, that, I, I really, I, I don't want to be, but I'm a fan of peanut butter whiskey. I've had Screwball. Oh, it's and it's, so it's, good. It's better than you would think. I 100% can tell you that works as a guy who likes to go golfing and put screwball and Bailey's in his coffee on the way to the golf course on Saturday mornings. That's the way to go. (laughs) All right. Um, We have a few non-cocktail announcements here. Don't miss any of your favorite Security Weekly content. You can visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to any of our podcast feeds and have all new episodes downloaded right to your phone. You can also join our mailing list, our Discord server, which we watch live as as we do this, if you have any comments and you're also watching live, and follow us on social media and our streaming platforms. All right, and uh, if you're on Twitch or YouTube, uh, thanks to Sam, we now have this cool bot that will uh, send any comments from those platforms to our Discord and vice versa. So we don't have to watch like three different platforms at the same time, it's really convenient. All right, so our first interview today is sponsored by Keeper Security, and the topic is securing your secrets. We are excited to have Zane Bond, Director of Product Management from Keeper Security with us today. Zane has managed various cybersecurity solutions for more than 12 years across many disciplines, including endpoint security, network detection, machine learning, and AI, incident response, privilege access management, and now credential and secrets management. Welcome, Zane. Oh, thank, good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, it's uh, definitely an interesting topic to talk through, so I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, you know, there's a lot to talk about here with secrets management. D- do you have a favorite cocktail you wanted to share before we Ooh, jump favorite into Favorite cocktail. So generally, I'll drink wines or um, scotches, um, but, you know, I, I, I've been known to enjoy um, various types of martinis. Um, or yeah, probably martinis probably go from that. Um, some of the ones mentioned earlier sound awesome. I will have to hit up Katie and try and get some of her uh, recommendations. Happy to share, <laughs> but no secrets. I will not share secrets. Oh well, <laughs> I can help with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are some secrets in the in the cocktail world. You know, definitely uh, some bars wanting to to keep their signature drink secret so talking about the secrets manager here like like first of all let's um you know i i love that your background is is so diverse and i actually just uh i'm in my third or fourth week as a uh uh, doing product management myself so uh all right really interesting yeah (laughs) really excited about it and and really interested uh to to talk about this because this is something that seems like it it solves such a, a broad problem, you know, so so well, so gracefully, but I still don't see a lot of people using secrets managers. You know, not not the personal ones, not the consumer ones, not the. I mean, obviously, some people are. You know, and I've seen some companies that basically require their employees to use them now. Um, but my life is just so much easier after I started using these kinds of tools. Um, and just to clarify. The secrets manager we're talking about today, are we talking about, um, yeah, I know we're talking about like the application secrets manager, but are we also talking about a a product that can hold um, like shared credentials between sysadmins and and then their own personal ones? Is this all one product or do you have a couple different products that do this? Um, Pretty much everything ties into the same platform, the same product. So um, Keeper Security throughout historically has done a really good job of solving a lot of the human use cases, right? Just if if you're like, if you're a digital citizen on the internet today, you've got hundreds of logins, passwords, ones you don't know about. And so over the last decade or so, Keeper's done a really good job of solving everything around that. Uh, Most importantly, taking the, the ridiculous cognitive load of how do I remember 300 different passwords to 200 different sites, or maybe three passwords to 200 sites? Hopefully, you don't reuse them. Um, but taking that and making it easier, um, you know, one of the tough things with most security products is you've got this weird balance of 
we're going to introduce more security and it's going to be a little bit harder, but hopefully it's not too much harder for the security you get. Um, whereas with the password vault, it kind of flips that on, on its side because you get incredible increases in security. But once you use one, the internet's just easier, right? You, I need to go to Facebook. It just logs me in. I don't have to pay attention. I need to go to you know a business website and it, it authenticates. And so it's really interesting working on a security product that ends up making your life easier and increasing security. That's uh, pretty rare. However, what we've done within the platform over the last uh, year or so is we've extended our use cases outside of um, accessing what you need everywhere, right? So, you know, whether it's mobile, web, desktop, um, Apple Watch, like wherever you need. The secrets management use cases um, really talk more to your uh, more technical audiences and your more privileged accounts. As an example, um, when somebody is trying to get in and get your information, right? Typically, they're not trying to look for Tyler's desktop login. Like that's not where all the juicy information is. It's the data that your business has. So whether it's your source code, your customer lists, your databases, your, um, your private information, your PI, all that stuff. And the systems that protect your most sensitive data, your code systems, your DevOps systems, your check-in systems, they still need to communicate and they still need to authenticate to each other and prove who they are. And so secrets management is really the, the discipline of better password and credential management for those machine use cases instead of just for the human use cases. So a slightly long answer, but hopefully I, I got that answered for you. Yeah, no, no, that that that's an excellent answer. And you mentioned a couple things that um, I was going to bring up if you didn't, you know, the fact that, you know, what you traditionally think of as secrets, you know, I, I tend to use mine for a lot more than just that, you know, like software licenses will go into my secrets manager. Um, anytime I'm asked uh, safety or, or, you know, recovery questions or anything like that, yep. like I, those are ridiculous. Like I, I just put completely ridiculous stuff in there or just random words. And, uh, and it's always awkward if I have to talk to a human and, and tell them what the recovery uh, questions are because they, yeah. you know, you know, like, where did you grow up? Pineapple, you know, like <laughs> have nothing no, to do um, with, with the answer to the actual question. No, it, it, it's, it's actually a good practice. Um, you know, hard. You, you see these silly surveys on Facebook or whatever, where it's like, you know, what type of Pokemon are you? And they're like, what was your pet growing up? Did you have a pet name? You know, like they ask you these silly <laughs> questions, but those are just harvesting these recovery questions because some people have gotten better at password security and are using more complex or maybe they haven't been breached, but the recovery side is another avenue. So yeah, that's a great practice. And as far as securely storing your information, you really hit the nail on the head, right? It's not about logins. It's not about tracking what I need to log into. It's the entire access um, and even recovery process. So if you have you know, your website, you have a login, you have a, a two-factor code, you have recovery questions, maybe you got some backup codes, uh, maybe you got some notes for whatever, just use all that. It's, it's a great place to store that because you know, it might be in your mind, but six months, a year from now, there's zero chance you're remembering it. And so when it's top of mind, put it somewhere safe, and then it shows up when it's relevant. And then um, on the application and business side of it, it's a lot more than just credentials to log into systems, right? You've got your um, SSL certificates, you've got your SSH keys, you've got API keys, you've got um, you know, domain accounts, you've got local accounts, service accounts, you've got all these different things that you can manage and storing those and being able to retrieve them um, in an encrypted format from a you know secure system instead of having them plain text all over the place. That's really what we're um, solving with our secrets manager solution. So I have, I have a question for you, um, Zane. In the utopian dream future, do we ever get to a state where we don't have to worry about passwords anymore and we can, you know, have some kind of uh, automated multi-point, multi-biometric, you know, 
DNA driven insert whatever vector you want. But is there some point at which some kind of behavioral model is used to do authentication and we don't have to worry about this garbage anymore? Is that a, or is that a pipe dream? Hmm. I think that, that's, that's a great question. I think there's a possibility of us getting there. Um, I think universally, like what we've done over the last two 20 ish years and gotten ourselves into is just this ridiculous uh, passwords for this, logins for that, two for this, different everything. And so it, almost across the internet, you know, people agree passwords suck. I don't want to remember these 200 things. I don't want them getting breached or getting somebody known them. And they're not a great way to, to really validate who I am. And so when a technology like passwordless comes around, people are like, that's great. I don't know what it is, but I want one of those, right? And then you peel the layers back and passwordless means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got your factors for authentication, right? It's something you know, something you are, something you have. You, those are your three primary. You've got other ones like some when you are, some where you are. But there is a possibility getting there. Uh, I think the closest analogy I could draw is moving as a society from cash to credit card or cashless. Um, and as you can see, we've been doing that for 45, 50 years now. And we understand that a credit card is so much easier than carrying around coins and bills. And, you know, somebody holds you up and steals your credit card, you can just call and um, get rid of it. But why do we still have cash? There are valid reasons to use it. And there are valid reasons to be either skeptical or not want to go into pure cashless options. Um, that is really you know, front and center if you ever lose your credit card. You're like, wow, what do I do? How do I live? Um, so I think we'll be in a similar bucket moving to a passwordless approach. Like the, the alternatives exist. Strong multi-factor um, is a really, really good way to protect your most sensitive accounts. Um, using uh, stores like you know, enterprise password management vaults or sequence manager solutions is a great way to increase the entropy of your passwords and increase the complexity uh, to the point where a lot of these attack vectors get eliminated. But it's it's going to be a long haul to, to end up in a passwordless society. Wow, that, that's a great answer. I, I'm, I'm going to maintain the dream myself and say we'll get there someday. Uh, but yeah, that being no, said... It's, it, 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 as different platforms enable it, right? As different companies enable it, it becomes more of a reality. So don't don't lose the dream. Definitely hang on to it, right? Um, you know, but it's it's going to be a slow and long haul. Yeah, and I love the analogy that you use for the cash uh, cash to digital, right? But then I'll I'll chuck into that analogy. Great. So when when Bitcoin takes over, we'll we'll figure out where that takes us. But that's probably pushing the analogy a little bit too far. Let me shift gears a little bit on the discussion though and talk about secrets within code or within systems or infrastructure or architecture that we that we uh, as as uh, security security people handle every day. Uh, it feels like as we shift to the cloud that the concept of tokens or secrets within our code and systems, is becoming significantly more important. Obviously, it's becoming more important as we move to infrastructure as code and things like that. And we're seeing breaches quite frequently with um, security tokens and keys residing in GitHub and things like that. What's the recommendation for security there? Uh, obviously, you know, application security and infrastructure security controls come into play, securing your GitHub, designing the applications in a way that um, you know pulls the secrets at, at runtime or at execution time as needed. Um, from the keeper vantage point, is there anything that you guys do to help uh, alleviate any of that pain? Uh, the, the, the simplest answer is stop hard coding stuff. Um, that, that's, that's almost always where companies get into um, hot water. So it's either hard coded passwords or default password that wasn't changed. And a secrets management solution really allows you to do that, right? So you've kind of got three parts of the business that handle the most sensitive and secure privileged accounts or three personas of the business. Um, you've got your developers, right? The guys actually writing the code. And sometimes, um, especially when you're in like dev and QA, you're like, well, I'll just put the password there and later on somebody will yank it out. And when we go to prod, it'll be magically more secure. 
um, that gets forgotten. And, you know, if it's the same password, um, then it's still a problem because it's hard coded somewhere. So getting into the practice of don't hard code these credentials into your source, find a way to do some tokenized replacement. Hey, by the way, we make that easy. But if you don't use us, use something, please. Um, the second type of um, persona where you run through and credentials kind of get um, hard coded somewhere, your, your DevOps teams, right? The guys who pick up the code, package it up and get it out to market. Um, they're going to use any number of solutions um, to build and deploy, whether it's Jenkins, GitHub, Terraform, um, GitHub Actions, Ansible. Like there's, there's a whole army of solutions out there that are used to do this. Um, every one of them allows you to either put the secrets or passwords or API keys into the build scripts, or maybe they have their own vault, um, but then you've got 10, 20, 30 little mini vaults floating around your business for every tool. You know, Azure's got one, Google's got one, um, every um, other solution's got something. And understanding the security of those, understanding the compliance requirements, and if somebody leaves, figuring out if it's even possible to rotate one of those, like what happens if I change that password? Like you know, half the time, the whole business goes down, like the website was using it. So for that second set of personas, don't hard code your passwords or don't store those credentials in 20 or 30 different systems. Get it somewhere that's secure and safe. And then lastly, you've got your, your IT professionals, your IT admins who are you know, whether it's they're running scripts or they've got some jobs that run or scheduled tasks, um, those things, you know, if it's performing something that needs to run with any kind of privilege, they need to run as a user. And again, you find that those get hard coded somewhere. So it's really about um, stop. I, the closest analogy would probably be stop leaving sticky notes with your passwords all over your infrastructure, because um, that, that's the uh, you know developer equivalent. Um, uh, just don't do that. Store them somewhere else because um, it's just th those those are the credentials protecting your crown jewels. That's that's what people are looking for when when you actually do get breached. So so as a product manager, you know I, I suspect you probably deal with this and and think about this a lot. You know, but what are some of the one of the, what are some of the things you use to incentivize people to get away from these bad practices? Or to, you know, what what are some of the roadblocks that you find you have to get past to get people, uh, you know, doing this? Like I, I imagine some of it's just the effort, um, and then some of it's remembering that it's even there to be, to be used. But what what do you see with customers? You know that that helps yeah, them no, um, get into good habits. Of course, so pushing security products like ten years ago was really tough because nobody really cared. Um, luckily, the incentivization is being made for us by bad actors. Um, the the good <laughs> slash good bad point. news is there's there's way too much money to be made um, in being um, a bad actor, right? You got the couple teenagers that were arrested yesterday. You know, fourteen million pounds um, just in personal revenue. It's just there, there's too much money to be made. So the incentive is you're being targeted. Somebody's going to look for you, whether it's just a generic spray and pray of every attack of everything. Let me scan every repo I can. Let me look at every system out there. Let me capture any config file I can and see if there's a password or if it's more targeted and somebody's looking at your tech stack and building a you know slightly more bespoke um, attack vector. So the incentivization is don't get hacked. Um, unfortunately, at least for us, we find that's normally the catalytic event for a customer to look for an appropriate solution. After something terrible happens two or three times, then it's like, all right, well, let, we should probably spend some money on this. Um, but it's happening a lot lately, and there's more laws coming around around people having to um, externally disclose what's happening, which is forcing a little more awareness around this. So. Um, Real hacks are one incentive. Uh, compliance frameworks, just anything. If you have medical data, you've got HIPAA. If you're um, trading uh, in the EU, you've got GDPR. If you take credit cards, you've got PCI. If you're publicly traded, you've got SOX. There's a whole lot of compliance frameworks. And every single compliance framework, like almost always, section 1.1, .1, don't be done with passwords. 
Um, and so I, I think it's it's universally understood that password, credential, secrets management is necessary. And it's um, it's really just about finding a solution that's easy enough to adopt and where you are in your security journey. Um, are you there and ready to pick up a solution? Because, you know, that's what we run into. Yeah, you know, definitely getting hacked is a is a pretty good incentive. Unfortunately, that's that's usually the best time to get your, uh, you know, your security needs and budgets filled. But, um, uh, you know, another another thought that occurred to me here, you know, with with home and work life, uh, like they've been blurring long before the pandemic, um, you know, but how do you account for people needing to use a, a, a secret manager for work stuff and for home stuff? You know, do they and, and what do you see in practice? You know, do, do people use their personal secrets manager for work stuff? Do they use their work stuff for personal things? Or you, how do you deal with that when you when that comes Man, up? Those, those get mixed all the time. Um, so I think step one, if you're using a secrets vault, congrats, you're, you're better than a spreadsheet. Um, that's amazing. But yeah, the, the blending of the business and personal accounts, I guess a little tricky. Um, at least one thing we do at Keeper is if you purchase the business or enterprise solution, you get free family accounts. So at least you have the same solution being used at home and the office and things can be shared between the two and you can have, um, you know, sometimes you have a need for um, certain personal accounts to be available on a business machine so you can share between accounts. And then, you know, when that relationship ends, you can unshare and revoke them. But it's ultimately whoever owns the record so if you're in a business account and you store it in there, then the business ultimately owns it, then they can recover those um, at, you know, at whatever point is necessary. And then if you have one personally, um, your records, you know, you can revoke and unshare them as needed. So um, yeah, mixing of the two, it's, it, it happens a lot, um, all, all the time. And it's tough. Some companies are a little less prescriptive on this kind of like don't ask don't tell and others um whether it's through a compliance framework or just business policy or just like absolutely not don't do that and you know they'll they'll outright block um any any exfiltration attempts or external sharing options can you explain yeah, so I, why that matters why if an employee has their own account you know let's say uh one pass or a last pass and the company uses the other or any of the others that are out there, Keeper, obviously, um, for an enterprise account, why does it matter to keep some separation? You know, because as you said, in certain circumstances, I mean, I've certainly been in situations where I had my personal account, a consumer level account, not an enterprise level account that protects my own stuff. And one of those things was access to payroll. And I need that for my, my taxes, right? So I need that whether or not I'm still there at the end of the year and the beginning of the first quarter. So if it's in an enterprise account, that's problematic for me as a person, as an employee. But why does it matter to an enterprise that I keep either segregation within my enterprise account like Keeper or I have another personal free account with another company? Yeah. So fundamentally, like, the base requirement is that a company wants to protect its own assets and its own accounts, right? So if the solution the company provides, um, and hopefully they provide something, um, enables them to, like, if you have a vault that your company provides and you can store your company secrets in there, you have know, to log into the servers and the websites and all the necessary stuff, if you can store that there, that's usually the primary concern, right? Um, it's it's some of those what if scenarios like all right what if you leave what if you get hit by a bus continuity of the business that's the primary driver and what what sometimes happens is in the absence of good adoption of a vault people store those things somewhere and so they either store them on the bottom of their keyboard they store them in an excel spreadsheet or they may store them in a personal vault and so that's typically the point where the business starts to care is 
if the business secrets are stored somewhere that um, may allow access after employment ends or may allow certain amounts of things to occur there, that's normally a concern. And then unfortunately, you just get some companies that just have terrible draconian policies of thou shalt not do this and we're not going to tell you why, just that's dumb. Makes sense. Now, my next question is about the companies using Keeper and other password managers and Secrets Vault, because we've certainly seen greater adoption in the last few years, EA, um, password list, there is a slow move towards it. And as, as Tyler alluded to, there are a lot of ways where we can do behavioral slash hygiene or biometric authentication without needing passwords at all. But there's a little bit of that cringe or that creepy factor that still is there in the minds of some non-technical people and even technical people, you know, the, the, the tracking that goes on with it. So what would you say for those companies and individuals who are still really on the fence about using a password or a secrets vault or manager either on their own or for their organizations? Yeah, no, uh, great question. So I think at, at the at the end of the day, most of cybersecurity is about risk management, right? It's you're you're protecting it, and you're you're never going to get to 100% protection. So, is this investment can provide me enough mitigation of risk, something like that? So when you talk about um, a lot of the concerns, right? If if your um, password vault or secrets management solution is online, the potential risk that you may run into is what happens if that vendor gets compromised? What happens if that vendor has a malicious insider? What happens if you know that vendor goes out of business or something, right? So it's really, again, it comes down to understanding the risk. And so selecting a vendor that has like you know, zero trust built in, handles and eliminates some of the malicious insider components. Um, zero knowledge is a very important one for cloud vendors. So zero knowledge effectively means, um, can that vendor view your data at all? And a true zero knowledge vendor would not be able to get to it at all ever. So this, this involves things like all decryption is done client side, all decryption is done you know, when the customer accesses the data. Um, it's one of our Keeper's foundational tenets is that everything has to be zero knowledge, zero trust, because um, just it's it's the most secure way to ensure that even if something goes wrong on our side, um, effectively all we have is ciphertext. You have the keys to decrypt it yourself. Um, and then with biometrics, um, that's a tricky one. Uh, biometrics are good, um, but when you think about it, if that ever gets hacked, um, you can't really change your iris. You can't really change your fingerprints. And so some of the concerns about that being your primary authentication method is what happens if there's some kind of a compromise there? You can't really, you know, fix that. And so that's one of the barriers to moving to a passwordless, um, to a passwordless paradigm is that some of the alternatives have some of these unknown questionable um, answers, which is, well, yeah, instead of, you know, the factor being something you know, a password, let's move it to something you are, an iris scan, then the what if um, really breaks down and gets tricky there. Yeah, really, really good questions, Katie. Um, Zane, thank you so much for joining us on Enterprise Security Weekly today. No, awesome. Happy to, happy to chat. This was a lot of fun. Definitely. Uh, make sure you check out securityweekly.com forward slash keeper security to learn more. Uh, some some good details on their website on everything they do. We, we covered just a, a tiny bit of, of all the stuff they can do. So check that out for sure. And stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to talk cyber insurance with Erin Keenley from Sentinel One. And the first question I'll be asking her is if I'm saying that correctly. <laughs> <laughs>